Then in 1994, we got into franchising. And it was really interesting. There was, some people think, uh, you know, most businesses go into franchising. It's, it's really funny. I was, the other day, I was fortunate enough to have uh, lunch with the CEO of Yum Brands. And um, we were there's a place over here on Cooper called Super Chicks. It's a concept store for them. And I went to that recently, but I was talking about that with him. They just opened a second location, too. And um, talking about their evolution in franchising, what they've, and how they built that. And a lot of, there's a lot of businesses that open a concept to get into franchising. And then there's a lot of them that, that don't really have a grand plan. They build a business, they like it, it's successful enough that they start franchising at some point. That's what happened. So we got this store at Forest Lane and 75 in North Dallas, okay? So my dad had an office. There's an adjunct on the west side of the building. It was his little office, right? So he'd work over there every day. So he's meeting with different people, meeting with banker, lawyers, whoever. But every day at noon, he would walk over to the main part of the restaurant and cut the block. And in a Dickie's Barbecue, in most barbecue restaurants, the helm of the restaurant, the leadership is from the block. It's not out in the dining room doing table touches. It's not at the cash register. It's not in the back. It's the block. You can get the vantage point of the whole restaurant. You're cutting the meat. You're in charge. That's your cost center. That's your profit center. That's where I want to be. That's my dad. That's the way I was brought up. That's our company tradition. He'd be cutting the block. So there's this longtime customer that came in. This guy's name is Frank, okay? Frank would come in all the time, and he would be like, hey, Roland. He's like, I love coming in here. Why don't you uh, sell me a franchise? I come in here every Tuesday, I get a plate of ribs, I love your ribs, I love your other meats too. How about you sell me a franchise? My dad's like, we don't want to sell you a franchise. We don't do franchise. We own our stores. You know, why, why get into all that? We don't need all that stuff. And so the guy, he was just persistent. He just kept coming in saying, sell me a franchise. And so finally, this goes on for a couple months, right? So finally, my dad says, all right, Frank, damn it, I'll sell you a franchise. And that was our grand plan. That's how we got into franchising. And there's a book that I read um, that was actually by the founder of Subway, Fred DeLuca, um, and he, he says, start small, finish big. And that's kind of one of our business philosophies. And so uh, at some point I want to write my own book, and, uh, but that title's already taken, unfortunately. But, so, but that's what happened. So we kind of got into franchising like that. Let's see, we got this thing up and going. And since then, hold on one second. Oh, there it is. See, we got this fancy map up here and uh, with all these dots on it and the number 500. The significance of the number is uh, 500 is because, because at this moment right now, um, at, uh, at about 9.45 Central Standard Time, we have 498 restaurants open, um, but as of in an hour and 15 minutes from now, we're going to open restaurant 499 and restaurant 500. So today's our big 500. So it's too bad that it's not a Friday afternoon, because otherwise we would have wheeled a keg in here. We had some fun, right? <laughs> so we've been wanting to get this done for a while. So there's the original store. There's a couple of customers that just got caught in the picture that day. We don't even know who they are, but we thought it was a great picture, so there they are. OK, there's, there's like the history real quick. Original, my dad, with Ronald Reagan, hanging out there. My grandmother who did the books for a long time. My dad, back then, this, this is 1976 when this picture was taken. And I said, you know what, we got a couple Cadillacs in 1976. He said, oh, put the Cadillacs in the picture. So there they are. <laughs> My dad decided at one point to get all fancy, so he said, I'm going to put a chef's hat on. So there is a chef's hat. And there they are, clinking the beers. So that's our history. Oh, and then here's like some more about all the milestones in our history. And basically, um, there it is. Oh, I'll tell you what, we went on Regis and Kelly Lee. There was a picture of me in the, there was, there's another one of these with me in the picture. Somehow we put the one up here with me out of the picture, and I don't, I don't know if I like that. But anyway, it was kind of cool. Hanging out with Kelly Lee was, was pretty cool. Um, uh, so anyway, um, so, we started, so we started franchising, all right? And we, um, it was really cool. And so, but in the beginning, in the 1990s, so we got our first franchise store open. And this guy, Frank, was like, hey, look, you, uh, you sell me a franchise? I will, uh, I will I'll, you know, not only will I uphold the quality that you guys have, have built for five decades, but 
I'll pay you guys a bunch of royalties. I'll do a bunch of sales. I'll do everything right. And you'll make money. I'll make money. It'll be great. And so it, it worked out. And that guy to op ended up opening a lot of stores. He ended up retiring. He, uh, his son named Dale uh, runs those, those stores now. And uh, he bought one of these like half million dollar RVs. And he loves NASCAR. Guy goes out and uh, goes and, and parks it in the middle. Uh, what do you call it the infield in the middle of a NASCAR track, you know? And he parks and he's got a golf cart thing and that's, that's what the guy does. And he goes to Talladega and Daytona and that's, that's what the guy does. And he made a whole bunch of money doing it. But word, word started spreading. And so we started getting other people here around the Dallas-Fort Worth area started joining. And so, and they began to open more stores. And then what happened was in the early 2000s, um, we began to run out of areas where we could expand as quickly in the Dallas-Fort Worth area. Because what we don't want to do is cannibalize restaurants, our stores, by putting them too close together. But there is an equilibrium point. So you say Subway. Now, so talking about them, they were, so you see a Subway like, you know, every, every mile, but then every, you know, inner city, you might see them every like quarter mile or something like that. You get it in a downtown environment, you know, maybe even closer, right? Is that bad? It's really not bad because there's a huge demand for sub sandwiches in the country. Or you see something like I was driving through downtown Arlington, there's a Babe's chicken house. Anyone here go to Babe's? I, I kind of like it. I mean, when I want like a, a, like a belly full of fried chicken tenders, I mean, that is the place to go, right? It's good. They, uh, I, I've been going there for years with my wife, Laura. But you don't put those too close together, right? I mean, you put, there's like one, every one of these like, you know, old ass downtowns. You know, and so that's, that's where they put babes. They got their whole thing going. They got their model. It works. But, that's, but they don't put them real close together because it's a destination location. And then there's, then there's other kind of concepts that are maybe somewhere in between. Maybe the Chili's or Texas Roadhouse or Papa Do's Seafood or, or like that. Every restaurant has got to find their equilibrium point. What happens if you don't put them close enough together? If you are expanding, what happens is if you say, okay, well, we're going to go, you know, one every 50 miles instead of every... 10 miles or 8 miles or even 5 miles, you're going to get a lot of competitors. You're going to get people that are going to see your success and then they are going to emulate what you're doing. And the next thing you know, instead of competing with your own concept 8 miles away, you're going to be competing with a competitor, a whole new competitor. And what you want to do is you want to lock in the market. You want to own the market. So that's, that's what we did. But we got to a point to where we couldn't put stores too close together. We still open stores in DFW that are we call like infill locations or maybe as the suburb grows like say Salina or Prosper or something you know we'll put a location up there bless you man but we don't want to put them too close maybe an inner city something like that but you've got to be you've got to like know what you're doing um, when it comes to finding the right locations and so we found that when we had we couldn't really grow as quickly in Dallas Fort Worth we needed to go out of this area it's not really hard to expand in the Dallas, in your home market, okay, wherever that may be. Like for Wendy's, it was like, you know, Columbus, Ohio. Wherever it is, your home market, you, you're, you're well known, you're established, you've been there, you can expand. But then when it comes to taking your concept to other cities, I know that you all are focused on international business, especially international. Now, we're not international yet, but I'm only just talk in the lower 48. You're not known. And so, that's a whole nother challenge. I mean, it's really stepping up. It's like going from conventional to nuclear, right? And so, how are you going to do that? Well, you got to learn a lot of things. And so, how, first of all, you wouldn't want to join a concept necessarily that has a home market and then has like a couple stores throughout the country, like maybe, you know, half a dozen stores, but they're home market saturated. Does anyone know why you wouldn't want to join a concept in that position? They wouldn't be able to support you. It would be tough. The supply chains wouldn't be there. The knowledge of other markets wouldn't be there. And so it would be tough. But what happens if you get to, going back to the subway thing, what if you like subway? And there's one every mile or even every quarter mile. It's saturated. You know, you can't really get there. But if you find the right concept that's at the right time where there's, they're well established throughout the country, but there's also there's, there also, there's opportunity to expand. There's still markets that are open. That's kind of where Dickies is right now, and that's why we're growing um, really fast because of our concept and because of what the opportunity is. And so that's kind of where we find ourselves. But it was tough getting ourselves established out of Texas. 
So have any of y'all been, and here in Arlington we've got a couple stores in South Cooper, we've got one on Ballpark Way. Um, have y'all, any of y'all been to those stores? So, all right, we'll check them out. But that is our older style. That is, those are big old kind of Texas cafeteria. And we're, there's some competitors. They're kind of the big old Texas cafeteria type um, location. And with a big variety of vegetables and the block, and you take your tray and you go through the line, you know, the, all that kind of thing. So when we first started expanding out of Texas in a big way in about 2005, we opened stores like that because that was our traditional model. You know what? We didn't do very well. And we had some problems and we stumbled a little bit. And we're in other states like Ohio and Colorado and California. And that model, it didn't do totally well. And so we're like, what's the problem? I mean, we're doing great here. We're rocking and rolling. We've got stores like that that are, you know, have always been kicking ass. And that's kind of what our thing is. What's the issue? Because we know our barbecue is great. We get lots of compliments. But, well, have y'all noticed around the country that there, or maybe when y'all were young, there used to be a lot of cafeteria chains. Do you, do you remember, like, I mean, Luby's is still kind of around, but there used to be Wyatt's. Furs, cafeteria, you remember you went with your parents on, in these kind of places? All right, so, but you notice they're not around anymore, Piccadilly. Every single cafeteria chain went into bankruptcy. And then there's just one or two that are left. But it used to be, you know, Sunday lunch in, in Texas and everywhere in the south, southeastern United States was go to the cafeteria for Sunday lunch, and those places stayed packed. My dad said as a kid, if he weren't needed Dickies, they would barely go out, but when they would go out, they'd drive from their home in North Dallas to Preston Center, and they'd go to Wyatt's Cafeteria, and both well, think what they had, they had like canned green beans and smothered steak and pot roast and meatloaf and like all that old kind of stuff. And my dad's like, look, that's all, you know, back in the 60s, whatever, that, that's all you'd really have. Those chains are gone. Tastes have changed. People don't really want that anymore. People, and so we found the big cafeterias, they weren't as popular. People didn't want that anymore especially where there's not a tradition for that. And so we said, you know what? We've got we've to evolve our model a little bit. And so we've got to kind of get with the times. Well, have y'all seen, it, I don't know if any of y'all like kind of watch the restaurant industry, but if you, in the 1970s, in the 80s, and in the 90s, um, fast food restaurants proliferated, right? And so that's when you got a McDonald's, a BK, a Wendy's, opening on every single quarter, uh, every single corner, and then also certainly you've got uh, churches and the Popeye. Okay, that's when they just exploded. That's when they just went everywhere, right? All right, then in the 90s, in the early 2000s, you saw the proliferation of, of, uh, of casual dining. So the Chili's and the Applebee's, you know, those places open everywhere. But then also you've got, then they, then they got in the late 90s when really like the, the economy was really booming. And so you got the bigger and bigger places like the, um, like the uh, Buca de Beppos and the Maggianos um, and their Claim Jumpers, and Rainforest Cafes. And you got those big, huge, like over the top in size kind of restaurants. All right, then what happens? We get the economy slows down in the 2000s and those places become oversaturated. So now look, you got oversaturation up here of casual dining. Okay, in the, in the restaurant business, you've got basically, you got fast food, aka QSR, you've got, you've got casual dining, and then you've got fine dining up here, right? Right here in the middle, you've got something called fast casual, okay? All right, does anyone know what fast casual is? Chipotle? Okay, anyone else? Panera? Um, let's see, what else? Five Guys Hamburgers? Okay, what do you got? You've got better, you've got food quality that in theory, conceptually, is as good as, as a casual dining restaurant, but with the convenience of a QSR, a fast food restaurant, and, and then but, and you got a price point that's about halfway in between, right? But notice one thing about these, the, the fast casual restaurants. Their menu is very focused, okay? They don't generalize, they specialize. They're not trying to be all things to all people. 